Thank you all. I really want to thank you for inviting me um, to your wonderful conference. I look forward to the sessions. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself um, in my own language. Yate she Jennifer Danette Dale and she Ogun Shlon ashe him bashes chin kisle chini da she che tuo head lili da she nala without a ya Danette stand in shle. I just introduced myself in the proper way as a Diné woman when I meet other Diné and when I meet other indigenous people um, in terms of we relate to each other by clan. And so I gave you my clans and that's who I am as a Diné uh, woman. I am in Albuquerque at the moment and I am sitting in um, Pueblo People's Territory, Kiwa, um, uh, Tawanteo Territory. Um, uh, and so I am a professor of American studies at the University of New Mexico. And I want to thank the organizers for um, allowing me to share my, my work here on um, COVID-19 uh, in, in um, within the United States, but also specifically how it has affected the Dene. Um, I have a different title here than uh, what I had presented at the, um, what I had offered as a title. Um, and I've changed my, my work as I've been going, going along. Um, this work that I'm presenting today is um, something that I've been observing for over a, a year since um, the, the news of uh, COVID-19 um, began to be, um, in the, in the media, um, particularly here on the Navajo Nation. So our Navajo word for um, COVID-19 is the Kosinsa 19. And so uh, I just wanted to situate you uh, of where we're at um, here in the, um, the, the United States. Um, the Navajo Nation, as you see here in the, um, in the red area, um, is one of the largest, is the largest land base of Native nations um, within the United States. And this area here that's inside of the, the red area, um, that is the Hopi Nation. Okay. So um, I'm originally from Tohatchi, New Mexico, which is on the New Mexico side of um, the Navajo Nation. So I would like to go ahead and start and share um, this work that I've been doing um, for the past year. On March 17, 2020, international attention turned to the Navajo Nation. In the southwestern United States, as Navajo reporter Arlissa Vicente relayed confir confirmation that a 46-year-old Navajo man had tested positive for COVID-19. The Diné had a travel history and was from Chichil Bito, Arizona, a community that would be highlighted in national and international news as a virus hotspot when it was re revealed that Navajos had attended a Nazarene Zones rally at the Chichil Batua Church and then returned to their nearby communities of Cameron, Coppered, Copper Mine, Kaibatua, Lachi, Tonalia Red Lake, and Navajo Mountain. Two Diné died, one confirmed to have attended the rally, and both had respiratory sy symptoms associated with the novel coronavirus. As we now know, the, corona, the coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus was, just, was first identified in December 2019 in Wuhan, the capital city of Hubei province, China. By January 12th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the virus an epidemic of national worldwide concern. On July 20, 2020, the Center for Disease Control uh, reported 3,106,932 3, cases of COVID with 59,260 new cases with a total of 132,855 deaths. And for that day, 799 new deaths. By May 18, 2020, the Navajo Nation's rate suppressed all the states, including New York, which had been in pandemic's U.S. epicenter. By June 1, 2020, the Navajo Nation reported 5,250 positive cases, 1,745 recoveries, and 241 deaths. 
Um, and on February 12th, 12, 2021, the Navajo Department of Health website reported that 29,098 Navajos had been tested and, and 1,097 had died from COVID. It is difficult to determine, to determine how many Navajos in border towns and urban cities have died from COVID. So the numbers of infections and deaths are likely much higher. After six months with a lull in the rates of infections and deaths, we experienced another round of the virus spread. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez ordered week, weekend lockdowns and week, weekday curfew multiple times while the border town of Gallup, New Mexico, set up roadblocks to deter the traffic from the Navajo Nation because Navajos increased the town's population of 22,000 to tens of thousands every weekend. Okay. And so here, I just want to show you that the Nav uh, uh, a page from the Navajo Nation Department of Health's um, daily updates. And so this one, every day they would, the, the Navajo Nation um, would post um, daily um, positive cases and, and deaths. And so this one is from September 19, 2020. And the area in which I um, mentioned where the, where the disease was first spotted was in this area right here on the northern, in the northern side of the, the Navajo Nation. Um, when I mentioned border towns, there are t um, towns um, that, are situ and, uh, that are situated on the outside border um, of the Navajo Nation. And so this area where the, where the um, or I have the area, the, the arrow, um, the, the border town of Gallup um, sits right here, okay, up on the north side in this area is Farmington, okay? So um, that's important and I'll, I'll mention that when I go on. On June 26, 2020, South Dakota Rapid City, in South Dakota Rapid City Health Data, the Rapid City Health Data revealed that 53% of people with confirmed cases in Pennington County were tribal members and that statewide Native Americans accounted for 14% of all cases while they were, while they are about 9% of the population. Native nations in South Dakota established roadblocks to regulate travel through their territory, while the governor threatened them, even as she refused to address the growing numbers of infections in her state. By July the fifth month, a second wave of the disease surged as the Trump administration absolved itself of any responsibility for, for the infection and death rates. The virus for which at, the, at that time there was no cure, although as of this writing there were vaccines, has become the source for political division and a, and a weapon for white supremacy to destroy the U.S. economy and re-entrench disparities that are now blaringly manifest as communities of color are drastically affected by infection and they suffer the highest infection and death rates. Across the U.S., Tribal nations followed the Center for Disease Control's guidelines and enacted some of the strictest measures of safety and protection, even as they battled with the federal government for funding to address the virus spread. In New Mexico and Arizona counties with significant Native and Navajo populations, Native leaders closed roads to their communities and enacted weekday curfews and weekday lockdowns in efforts to slow the virus spread. The public offered money, food, water, and personal protection supplies as part of the relief. Significantly, Native Nations efforts, which are based upon sovereignty and science to halt the coronavirus, are stymied by the uneven protection measures of cities, towns, and state governments, especially in Republican-dominated spaces where conservative Christian whites called for a faith-based approach and where protective measures such as wearing a mask in public are met with physical and verbal assaults. The pandemic in the U.S. was caused for the rest of the world to ban Americans from their borders. By August 14, 2020, the U.S. had the highest confirmed COVID-19 cases in the world, more than any other country, according to John Hopkins University. The virus has left very little, very few of my relatives untouched by the scourge. One of my uncles did not survive and his children reported his last words to them, which was that he didn't have the strength to fight it. 
Their father was buried in the veteran cemetery with only the pallbearers um, in proximity. In the Shiprock area, three siblings buried their mother, father, and brother and watched the burial service remotely because they had also contracted the disease. I answer a call from a relative who is in tears because several members of one family have contracted the disease and I listen quietly as she sobs her heartbreak. I cry along with the Navajo Nation as we learn of a popular local band's lead singer's death. In my extended kin relations, in the span of five months, three siblings have died one from COVID, one recovered from the virus but died soon after, while another died from illnesses, bringing us to think about who will be left to care for home places established by parents who came of age during the livestock reduction of the 1930s and 40s. This essay, this presentation offers an analysis of the still unfolding effects of the pandemic on the second largest indigenous nation in the US, the Navajo Nation. It places the viruses spread within the structures of settler, viol settler violence to demonstrate that the failure of federal Indian policies and laws sustain American colonial violences against the Dine. The U.S. remains a settler society whose multicultural, liberal, and democratic structure and form of government, governance reinscribes indigenous elimination over and over. The settler project is always cloaked in the rhetoric and practice of the U.S. settler nation lauding itself on gifting sovereignty, democracy to indigenous people. However, this gift is on settler terms and requires indigenous people to bend to settler sovereignty, their laws a single authority, and in that process renders indigenous life invisible, therefore invaluable, and strives to el eliminate as indigenous people. But it is not always as is said in the Game of Thrones that the winter is here. For indigenous people, including the Dene, have mapped their way out of multiple crises. crises. And I invoked the generative scholarship and community organizing practices of the Dene scholar, Melanie K. Yazi, who declares that struggles over life and death continue to shape the persistent refusal of Dene to accept the violence of liberal de developmental uh, ideologies. It is a refusal couched in a Diné tradition of uh, uh, it is couched in a Diné tradition of refusal and resistance that values enough life. And here I'm sharing a presentation um, which put the which um, put the Navajo um, Nation um, in international um, spot media spotlight. Um, one of the first places that the virus um, struck was when um, Navajo, family, Navajo families had attended, uh, had gone to um, urban spaces like um, Phoenix and then came back to the Navajo Nation and held um, a Christian church rally. Um, and so this is one of the, this is a, the place where one of the source, uh, the first sources of outbreak on the Navajo Nation. Okay. Um, this is a hot, uh, picture of a hospital in Gallup, New Mexico, um, the like other um, Native nations within the U.S., um, we are very dependent on Indian Health Service, which is felt, uh, funded by the federal government. Um, this is there are two hospitals in one border town, Gallup, um, and this is one of the hospitals that begin to receive um, COVID patients. Um, in, in this border town. And so they were also taking patients from the Indian Health Service um, when, there was an, uh, when there was just too many patients. Um, and so um, journalists and photographers rushed to document the arrival of the pandemic. What became clear was that the lack of infrastructure on the Navajo Nation was deadly. Sonny Dooley, a storyteller and a keeper of traditions, shared about the conditions on the southern side of the homeland. She writes, my hogan has electricity, but no running water. My brothers bring me water and they put it in a 75 gallon barrel. I drink that water and I wash with it, but I also buy five gallons of water for $5 in case I need extra. I typically use a gallon a day for everything, cooking, drinking, and washing up. Julie relates what we should better call the conditions of death. She says, 
we have a lot of cancers in our community, perhaps because of the uranium, and we may have other health issues that makes the virus so viable among us. We have a lot of diabetes because we do not eat well and a lot of heart disease. We have alcoholism. We have high rates of suicide. We have every social ill you can think of. And COVID has made these vulnerabilities more apparent. I look at it as a monster that is feasting on us because we have built the perfect human for it to invade. Dooley's stories indicate that the historical and colonial conditions that made possible the monster feasting us, specifically the social health and economic disparities also opened the space for the novel coronavirus to spread rapidly through Navajo communities. And so one of the things that I looked at as a, as a researcher and a historian was how, how and why the, the virus was able to just spread so rapidly through our Navajo communities. And of course, um, the Ne, we already knew immediately that it had everything to do with the poor infrastructure on the Navajo Nation. And so we live in conditions where our people have about 30 to 40% uh, percent of our people do not have access um, to clean water. Everything that is needed um, to live, um, food, clothing, materials for shelter, feed for livestock, um, we go into these border towns for, okay? Because um, we have not been able to build an adequate infrastructure on the Navajo Nation. And so that migration, that move, that movement back and forth um, is very much part of the reason why there was such a rapid um, spread of the virus on, into Navajo communities. Okay. Um, I have more here that, that I, I, I wrote. Um, there is a Navajo um, elder by the name of uh, Chili Yazi who was um, interviewed. Um, and Yazi, an elder in, from Shiprock, New Mexico, he says, everyone knows someone who has struggled with COVID-19 or died from it. Each day brings a new round of worry, grief, and fear. Yazi says for him, it's been a time of reflection, of trying to understand what is happening. He says, the world is in great disorder. The equilibrium of the earth is greatly upset. And perhaps the pandemic is the great discipline whip of the earth from having irretrievably damaged the earth. And this virus is a force to be reckoned with. It is alive with death. Okay. So I take these two to think, these two thoughts from Dooley and Yazi to think through US, uh, the US's historical treatment of its indigenous people, the systematic theft of indigenous lands and natural resources and the genocidal policies intended to eliminate us indig as indigenous people. For it is this history that created the conditions of death for the monster to feed upon us a theorizing of settler colonialism with its twin monster racial capitalism sets the terms for the devastation of communities of color and indigenous communities. The net health officials and laborers and leaders named the monster COVID-19, the Osinsagi-19, which translates at the big cough. After consultation with those who hold the knowledge of the old stories, and who connect the virus to our creation stories of monsters who wreaked havoc and killed our people. For the Navajo people, COVID-19 is one of the many monsters of the old stories who plague the people until changing woman, our, our um, holy deity, birthed her sons, the hero twins, who brought a new era into Navajo history of harmony and balance. It is to these old stories that the Dene look for answers. The stories tell us that there has always been monsters among us, but that we have a web of kinship networks of care, compassion, and generosity that refuse the conditions of death. Um, in this uh, essay that I wrote, I then go into detail about this long um, sustained exposure um, that the Dene have had to epidemics and to diseases. And so this, um, this, this pandemic, um, is just one of many across history that the Navajo people have had to deal with. Um, ever since um, our people were um, militarily subjugated by um, the American military and sent to a concentration camp, 
um, in the summer of 1864. And so it's, it's, part, uh, it's part of this history of exposure to epidemics and to diseases, okay? And one of the things that I note about this history, uh, which includes the history of healthcare, uh, that it reveals the roots of failed federal government um, that the roots of failed federal government response to the pandemic um, is now unleashed on Navajo communities. This failure is but one signifier of indigenous people as the survivors of a 500 year war that has not ended. Rather, the grounds for war has shifted from to the, uh, to the places where laws, governances, policies, and practices are the sources to eliminate us in, as indigenous people. Okay. Um, public health officials, indigenous leaders, and scho scholars immediately recognize that the rapid spread into communities where inequalities and poverty are, and disparities are conditions of life are also the conditions of death, revealing how and why the net communities were immediately hot spots. Okay. Um, one, and one of the things about this is that National media's attention to the virus was tainted with economic elitism as we participate in or witness the rebuking of people of color who cannot seem to stay home. We must go, we must for survival go to jobs. We live in crowded housing conditions and we now expose our vulnerable bodies for more scrutiny because we live with disparities. And so the Navajo people were also subject, subjected to such criticism um, in the national media you would see references to several generations of Diné living in one house or one hogan, one room hogan. The common sense that tradition has played a role in the spread of the, vi of the virus into Navajo land is further evidenced by interviews with Navajos who allowed images of their homes to accompany the stories written circulated. Ironically, homes are often dilapidated and several generations live under one roof not because it is traditional, because, but because it's almost impossible for Navajos to build a home on Navajo land. A proposition made difficult for a number of reasons, including high, high unemployment, poverty, and antiquated Navajo Nation land use laws and policies. Okay. Um, so this poor infrastructure makes it necessary for constant travel to border towns, as I've mentioned. Um, it takes anywhere from an hour to four hours to six or eight round trip just for to receive basic um, necessities. Okay? Um, so our, even though the Navajo Nation holds impressive water rights under the Winters Doctrine, at least 40% of households do not have running water. Rather, our natural resources like water, coal, gas, and oil and the vast open spaces of, of unpolluted air have been hijacked to feed the monster of the capitalism. It was the middle of March, 2020, when we began to hear about the virus and the advice to sanitize your spaces and wash your hands. I took my last trip to Winnipeg, Manitoba to visit with the indigenous faculty and students at the university. A trip a, I considered a brief break from 24 hours care for my mom who was courageously battling cancer in my home. Upon my return, mom was sent to the emergency room again. I could not be with mom because I had been out of the country within the last 14 days. In what would be the last days of her life, she listened to my sisters and I talk about public health concerns, the hoarding of toilet paper and sanitizing products and storing extra food. Mom suggested we buy canned foods and powdered milk, marking her familiarity with stark years for it was during the American Depression era that Navajos transitioned from self-subsistence to dependency on outside sources. That time is also known as the Livestock Reduction Era, when U.S. Indian Commissioner John Collier ordered the removal of 50% of Navajo-owned horses, sheep, and goats as a response to decades of federal officials' concern that Navajos had overgrazed the land with too many animals. The post-livestock reduction led to massive engineering of, Na of the Navajo tribe across institutions of Navajo life. And so in this um, essay that I wrote, I think about the, the time period that my mom and dad um, were raised. My mom, my dad was born in 1930 in Fruitland on the Navajo Nation, and my mom was born in 1934. And they are um, 
the last generation um, of the Nehu were fully integrated in a livestock economy. Um, and so once the, the livestock is destroyed under federal Indian policy, you then get the conditions that are, part, are the reason for why the spread was so rapid um, of the disease into our Navajo communities. And so I'm sharing with you a picture of my mom and dad. I'm very fortunate in terms of having had a mom and dad until I start uh, myself moving into um, elderhood. And so I'm very thankful for that. And here's a picture of um, what uh, the livestock economy, which was destroyed in, in the in late 1930s and 40s. Um, Navajo people say that sheep is life. And that means that life revolved around a land tenure system based upon keh, which means kinship. Keh is a complete, complex and sophisticated code of ethics, which stipulate how one cared for one's relatives, one's livestock, the land, and how to relate to the universe. This land ethic was practiced under American colonial conditions where Navajos had le less access to their traditional territories and with fewer livestock. So, um, like I uh, mentioned again, this history of US federal Indian policies and laws set the stage for the effects on the pandemic on that and native peoples, including the Diné. So they would be as du suddenly duly phrased, quote, the perfect human to invade, unquote. So this stands out um, in Navajo uh, memory because it's, a, it's a, a vast shift and transformation in Navajo life and it becomes um, the source or the place where we begin to um, depend on outside sources um, just to sustain ourselves. Um, and you can see the conditions of, of the land in 1930s and in the 1930s and 40s, which led up to the livestock reduction. Um, when I say that uh, um, this period began to re-engineer um, Navajo life, you know, we know that, you know, all these uh, scholars, these anthropologists, these white reformers who come into our communities, you know, with their intention of bettering life for us, their ideas about development projects. Um, this is, these are, this is, uh, and they were policy advisors um, to federal officials, okay? Um, and so you can see um, just how this become, you know, it becomes an experiment of how to transform indigenous people. And it was called the Navajo problem. Okay? Um, and this is from that era as well. I, I spent quite a few, a, a bit of time on this. And one of the things that I do want to mention also in terms of this transformation of the Navajo economy, um, the kind of relationships that developed um, after 1940s, particularly to the 50s and 60s, was this relationship between federal government and corporations that ostensibly were intended to, dis, to continue the dispossession of Navajo people from their land, alienate us from our land, um, but also to profit off of our resources. Okay. Um, Navajo, at the, at the same time that federal officials and white reformers sought to remake Navajos, Navajo resources were targeted for extraction to create the urban Southwest we see today. John Redhouse, Andrew Curley, and Melanie K. Yazi offer incisive analysis of how and why the Navajo nation is rendered a third world country where the Nebuchadnezzar is mined for natural resources to benefit settler towns and cities, in fact, creating them. Yazi draws upon the work of Red House to reiterate the vast network of connections between multinational resource extraction corporations, tribal governments, US polit politicians, and other invested parties to systematically rob the Navajo and Hopi people of their natural resources what Red House called the grand plan for the colonization of the Navajos. It is this network of relationships to settler colonial institutions that leads to the conditions of life or more accurately, conditions of death for the Diné in the present. Um, the other thing that I want to say um, in terms of this um, is that, it, so these conditions create, our, our people have become dependent on these towns and cities for basic um, necessities. 
Um, and I, I have a, a whole lot, I've been studying this, um, the, the relationship with these towns that are established outside of the Navajo Nation. And this is not just, I think, um, something that you see in the American Southwest. If you go to South Dakota and, and um, North Dakota, you see all these populate, these towns and cities that benefit off of, um, create their economy um, on, our, on our backs. You know, it's, it's not just something that you see in the Southwest. Um, so I, I talk, I, I, I offer some um, examples of that. Um, and that this migration, this movement back and forth also facilitates the spread of these, um, this um, disease. An explication of border towns, a look at border towns, demonstrates how we as Diné become not only lawless, but rendered invisible in the present crisis of the, the virus, not worthy of the care needed to survive. It is necessary for scholars to move past dated paradigms that impose imaginary bi bound binaries such as res urban because studies of border towns and urban spaces reaffirm that indigenous people in Diné are always in the spaces of their homelands, regardless of settler efforts to eliminate and re erase their presence. This is reinforced by the statistics that approximately 70% approximately of native people live off designated native lands. And so the pandemic is not confined to geographical area. Okay. Um, I, I spent a lot more time explicating the, um, the, the, what happens in these border towns and how indigenous people um, are um, treated. Uh, I think that what's comparable in terms of this work is also the work of, um, I'm spacing her name, the one who did the, the work on um, the treatment of indigenous people in um, towns and cities in, in Canada as well. And so we, we see very much um, similar kinds of issues and problems, particularly um, the, the, the large number of um, unsheltered relatives who live on the streets in this town and how they also um, are the most vulnerable um, of our people. And so there's a commonality of, um, of um, historical a historical context that um, shapes indigenous experiences, um, not just within the US, but also um, in Canada and in Latin American countries um, as well. Um, so it, I just wanted to share a couple more slides with you and then I want to, um, to talk about this politics of care that I had brought up in, in the title that I submitted for this talk. Um, when we're talking about um, this transformation, this engineering of Navajo life and of indigenous life, you think about all the institutions that are set up before we're born and how we become um, conditioned to life under um, settler colonialism. And that includes all these con uh, institutions, including education, okay? So that we come out um, supposed, to, supposed to be the, a liberal citizen of these settler nations. Um, this is a picture of, uh, in boarding school, um, I, look, I found some policy, some um, documents of this period from the late 1940s and 50s where uh, federal officials are looking for ways to remove Navajo people off the land because they say the land simply cannot sustain um, the Navajo population. Uh, and so boarding school was one of the strategies to remove our people from the land. And so Sturt, Nevada, um, Carson's um, Sturt Indian School was where my parents met um, and they married. And so these buses would come um, in, the, in the beginning of the school year, prior, right prior to the school year at specific uh, pickup points and pick up uh, children um, to take to these um, far off uh, boarding schools, okay? And then um, one of the things also about uh, a removal from um, a sustainable economy based upon your own resources is the introduction of wage, the wage economy. Okay? And so my father is the first generation of the Ne um, who looked for a wage work. And my dad was um, fortunate because he landed a job with El Paso Natural Gas Company and worked for 25 years um, with the company. Okay. Um, and so here's a picture of my dad in his, um, his workplace. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to add some, show you some pictures here before I get um, to the end of my talk here and talk about um, one of the things that I want to bring up is that there is during the 
during the pandemic, there has been this sense of loss and despair. There's been this sense of a nostalgia, okay, about mourning for the past, mourning for a time before COVID. Okay? And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, and here you see um, a um, health worker, healthcare worker, just absolutely exhausted, okay, from um, attending to um, the care of COVID uh, patients. Um, my sister, you know, on the Navajo Nation, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, there isn't a person I don't know who didn't have someone who died from COVID um, or who knows of, of families that died from COVID. Okay? Multiple families, multiple members of an extended family um, uh, have died. And so when you're driving, um, like from most of the time we go into border towns um, and you'll see these signs along the road, you know, because um, one of the things about, like I mentioned, these indigenous nations and, and leaders is that they really lock down hard, okay? Um, and so you would see these signs along the road due to COVID, no, absolutely no visitors. And my sister sent me some pictures one day from just a 20, like a 20 mile drive from my home community of Tohatchi to Gallup, there was three signs in a row of, Na of Navajo fam at the, at the gate. Navajo families were, had a sign out there that said, this, this, turn down this way, this is, the, this is um, the place where we're accepting donations for funerals, for funeral expenses, okay? Um, so I want to just mention a couple more things. Um, and then get to this politics of care that I was talking about. At the moment that the U.S. is seeing the devastation that the coronavirus is wreaking, particularly causing an already poor economy to further collapse and creating strands, strains on the healthcare system, Black Lives Matter is in focus as the Black community protests police violence. The demands of young Black people to end racism police violence and poverty and all manners of inequality and just injustices resonate with indigenous communities who stand with their black brothers and sisters in solidarity and also call for indigenous liberation. Ironically, the federal government and state leaders rush to confront protests, calling upon, calling up state and city law enforcement and the National Guard, spending millions while they lagged at controlling the coronavirus. As Kienga Yamanta Taylor declares, quote, state leaders have become much more adept in calling up the National Guard and coordinating police action to confront marchers than they were in any efforts to curtail the virus, unquote. She asserts, quote, we have to make space for new politics, new ideas, new formations, and new people, unquote. She further elaborates, if we are serious about ending racism and fundamentally changing the United States, we must begin with a real and serious assessment of the problems. We diminish the task by co continuing to call upon the agents and actors who feel the crisis when they had opportunities to help solve it. She offers, we have the resources to remake the United States, but it will have to come at the expense of the, pl the plutocrats and the plunderers, and therein lies the 300 year old conundrum. America's professed values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, continually undone by the reality of debt, despair, and the human depredation of racism and inequality. And so here you have, um, during the, the, the pandemic, you have young Diné who are in, in um, solidarity with Black Lives Matter, and they're organizing uh, marches and rallies in these um, border towns um, at this, um, this uh, sign here says, we will be strong through kinship. Uh, and so, you know, these small towns that are outside of the Navajo Nation who depend on Navajo resources um, for their economy are actually very fearful of indigenous people. And so when there's word, um, it's announced on social media, there's, there's going to be a march in Gallup. This is Gallup, New Mexico. Um, the business owners and the city leaders become really frightened and concerned and 
they're busy lining up, uh, they're busy um, boarding up their business in fear that there's going to be a riot. You know, the indigenous people are always frightening when they when they seem to be out of control. Um, and of course, you also have in the, uh, the American landscape, the rise of white supremacy, where you see, um, in, in our case, um, white men uh, and also Hispanics um, who are fully outfitted in armor as a militia, you know, and they, of course, are not, are, are just given a nod by the police, okay? And so um, in Gallup, New Mexico, there was an episode, um, there was an event there where the business owners were just really scared, the city leaders were, and the militia were coming out patrolling um, uh, uh, the streets, and you have young Diné here who are um, showing uh, solidarity with Black Lives Matter. So as the pandemic rips through our communities, leaving us um, devastated, the net poet Jake Skeets asked us what we are grieving and why we might long for the time before the virus, when the reality is our people were already suffering greatly under the American capitalistic system. He states, every month there are numerous headlines announcing the deaths that occur in border towns around the reservation. So if we yearn for time before this virus, are we also yearning for those ills as well? Or do we yearn for the post-pandemic, which will include either further disaster capitalism or the so-called end of times, both of which would be catastrophic for families in the United States? Skeet then goes on to affirm the integrity of our stories to address our grief and mend ourselves back together. He affirms that our relationships um, must be um, reiterated, our relationship to the land, and that this relationship tells us how we are related through, eh, through kinship. Indigenous people's dreams of freedom do not lie in the possibilities that the center state will ever transform. Rather, its structures of colonialism embedded in capitalism will always be violent and anti-Indigenous because it is required for its very survival. Rather than accommodating the settler state, which requires indigenous recognition within its colonial structures, oppressed communities benefit by collectively building power through communities and building relations based upon kinship. Kinship that goes beyond the limits of, of human to human, but relations to all living things. It is what the Neha who have shared their stories with Media Express we have always turned to the strength of our ancestors and we do so now. Recently, I spent the better part of a week filling out an application for funding on behalf of one of our distinguished elders who holds traditional knowledge about the cycle of life and the end of death, end of life, death. We plan to facilitate our people's return to traditional forms of replanting the body to help our relatives remember that we have our own concepts of life and death, concepts of the afterlife and proper preparations for burials. It is a turn away from capitalism and the carnivorous reach of border town predatory businesses. After studying this issue and doing the research, I realized that this topic is so sensitive, I must support a person who's a holder of our knowledge. After working with this traditional practitioner for nine years, having him offer prayers for my family's well-being, I affirmed the wisdom of our ancestors, of my parents and my father's teaching. Our ancestors' words also resonate in those of our thinkers like Leanne B. Simpson and Melanie K. Yazi. And here I quote Leanne Simpson. She says, uh, we cannot carry out the kind of decolonization our ancestors set in motion if we don't create a generation of land-based, community-based intellectuals and cultural producers who are accountable to our nations and whose life work is concerned with the regeneration of these systems. Their voices carry the wisdom of my ancestors. We come from a long tradition of resistance. It is not new knowledge to me, for my late father was a healer who prayed for our relatives every single day. And this, I want to end with a single Navajo mom um, who posted on her face, um, her Facebook page. She says, women are holding space, our Navajo indigenous women doing the work and holding lifelines. Yes, this pandemic hit us hard, 
small business owners on the reservation, such as our food sales, were literally our bread and butter. We are navigating our way through, and yes, we need to improve our infrastructure. We have children with lack of inter internet service. We live in a food desert and it's going to take us as a community to hold space, speak up, advocate, lend a hand and throw a lifeline. We are all in this, wear your mask, stay six feet or more apart and wash your hands. Okay? Um, and so then other than that, also shared their stories. Um, and I think one of the things about um, what the strength of our stories are and, our, and the memories of our, what our ancestors held um, dear was the return to traditional practices. So one of the things that you hear, um, that I hear at Danette talking about also um, is reinvigorating um, farming as a part of a way of life, you know, and what, what that means. Um, and so uh, the counter to the devastation to death is in life and its persistence through relationships that extend to the natural world and all beings. Through our relationships, we will revitalize our communities. Um, here's a picture of one of our council delegates, um, Eugenia Newton Charles, who um, represents chapters in the northern section of the Navajo Nation on the New Mexico side. Um, and here again is the, the, the indigenous, our young Dene and other indigenous um, demonstrating support um, for Black Lives Matter. Um, several um, mutual aid organizations um, uh, came into being. One of them is the Navajo P Families COVID Relief. And so there's been a lot of activity on the ground in terms of offering um, relief boxes to Navajo families. You know, um, there's, there's been stories where um, the conditions of life are so, are, are very harsh for many people. Um, journalists, Navajo journalists go out um, looking for our people to interview and they come across these incredible stories of, of um, poverty. And so what happens then in those cases, in several of the cases that were highlighted in the media is that people come forward to help um, uh, a lot of elders, you know, um, with, with um, food, with repairing shelter, um, get, getting them a larger water barrel, you know, so um, right now, um, Navajo Nation has one of the highest uh, numbers of um, Navajo people who've been uh, vaccinated. Um, it's very obvious and clear to us that um, water is needed. Resources um, that are used, that have been used to create the Southwest are really things that we need for ourselves. Um, and so some of the things that Navajo Nation has been looking to is to provide, expand access to running water and electricity, provide broadband access and more affordable housing on the, on the nation. One of the things that I personally have, as a researcher, I've been paying attention to um, is the number of deaths, the kinds of bureaucracy that our families are running into um, as they plan for um, um, replanting um, a, a relative's body, you know. Um, the funeral directors, there's very few, this is a very sensitive talk, uh, topic for Navajo people. And one of the things that, as I did the research, um, as the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, was to acknowledge that uh, probably 95 to even 99% of our, our people um, now practice Western Christian forms of um, funerals and burials, you know? And so if we're talking about decolonization and um, really moving away from the predatory businesses of border towns and cities. We really need to begin in multiple levels, returning to our, our own um, traditional knowledge and, and practice. And one place I think that is really important that we're moving on is how we take care of bodies when our relatives um, have left. Okay, so that's been one of my personal projects. Okay. March 23rd, 2021, the Navajo Nation on Monday reported zero new coronavirus deaths, cases or deaths in the previous 20 hour, 24 hours for the first time this year. Okay. Um, and that there's, a, there's been like five more deaths that are related to COVID since I uh, put this PowerPoint together. 
Um, so the Navajo Nation has started um, reopening. Um, they've also opened, I think, three of their um, three of their casinos. Um, but we still are following a, a mask mandate. Um, I'm not sure about the curfews. If there's if those are still in place, I haven't asked anyone. So, but that's this is just a, an image of. Um, the Red Nation, which is a which is an indigenous organization and movement, um, in which uh, so many of our people die in these cities. Okay, I'm also paying attention to um, the murdered, um, missing and murdered Diné relatives, which is a part of this movement of missing and murdered indigenous women. A lot of people die in these um, in these cities in these towns. Um, a lot of, uh, some of them are, there, a significant number are related to um, death by exposure. Okay? Um, and so we did, we, or the, the Red Nation organized a march in Gallup um, and um, one of the organized, the co-founders, um, uh, Nick Estes, um, took a lot of time to, to comb through um, documents and find the names of um, people who had died um, in, and this is just in, in Gallup. Okay. And this is, <laughs> you know, um, I feel really thankful and grateful that I had a mom and a dad um, for so long. And uh, this is a picture of me with my mom. And you can see, I, I guess we were up in the mountains. Um, my dad built um, his home and he cut the, the logs himself, um, dried them and chipped them. And so the house has really huge um, thick walls, you know. Uh, so I just wanted to include that that picture. So uh, if you have any questions um, or comments to share with me, um, thank you very much um, for listening to me. And I think that we probably have um, a lot in common in terms of across um, borders um, our our concerns about the state and the condition and the welfare of our indigenous people um, are very similar. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Denatali. Uh, um, your talk was very good. A uh, very inspiring, very heart wrenching listening to it and uh, listening to your stories because we have a lot of uh, similarities here in Manitoba and Canada and and. and around the world to uh, the global, uh, the global, uh, the indigenous peoples around the world. Um, the, some of the quotes that you raised uh, uh, really struck me, for example, when they didn't have the strength to fight anymore mm -hmm. as on the last breath. And um, border towns, so when that's a thing Mm -hmm. Two that we have in Manitoba, two in our communities, uh, the First Nation communities in Manitoba, we rely on, uh, we're going to lockdowns, but we have to go to the border towns uh, to access our services. Yes. I'm um, looking at the chat. I want to encourage uh, the audience uh, to ask any questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions for uh, Dr. Denital? Uh, we share a lot of um, uh, the problems, uh, the infrastructure and the poor infrastructure. We don't have uh, the infrastructure in place, uh, so we have to go to the border towns. And a lot of these resonate with uh, with what you're experiencing and what we've experienced here. For example, uh, um, uh, you were really struck hard, I guess, uh, during the first wave, and now yeah. Uh, we're being really struck hard in, in uh, the third wave. Uh, so it's really interesting, like uh, kind of uh, the second wave. Mm -hmm. uh, was, um, but I have a question here. Yeah. It's from uh, Maria, Maria Olivia Ross uh, regarding the quote you mentioned at the end of your talk from M. Yazi. What are your thoughts on 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 intellectualism. I actually have been thinking a lot about this question. Um, we have a, a question of what what 
you know, we have a mandate from um, our scholars who were some of the first to knock down the doors of the ivory tower and to insist and demand that um, we have intellectual, um, we have intellectualism that dates back to our ancestors' knowledge. And so that we are also have a responsibility and accountability to our indigenous nations and communities. And what does that look like as we search, you know? Um, and so community-based research is something that I've been thinking quite a lot about. Uh, as the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, it's the only um, entity of its kind um, within the United States that's supported by a um, indigenous nation, you know? And um, so when I mentioned uh, our work on starting to, to think about as practice, uh, how do we turn our, our Diné back to, or, or return to traditional um, knowledge about death, afterlife, and burial practices, um, this is one, one way to move away from the predatory funeral industry, you know, that proliferates. Um, and this is like a, t a very timely in terms of the numbers of death. And so this is a community-based research, you know. And so I think that um, I'm a, I like to think about my work as being um, a promiscuous theorist in that I draw upon numbers of schools, um, interdisciplinary um, I look at, uh, I, Melanie Kayazi also does in terms of, uh, I really love her work because she's really bringing out to the forefront an interrogation of capitalism and presenting a, a stance of, of anti-capitalism, okay? Um, these development projects um, that were foisted upon us to bring us into the modern world um, simply do not work, okay? They're really about theft, um, dispossession, um, and keeping us in the lower hierarchy of these settler colonial states. And so I think that um, we, we're very important as scholars um, and our, they, our people, you know, send us to school <laughs> because they rely on us to bring this knowledge and bring it together with our, with our knowledge from our ancestors. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a comment here from uh, Len Manitowapi from the Soul Lookout First Nation, and uh, she is acknowledging that that there's a lot of similarities between uh, uh, the U.S. and Canada, and we need to work together as nations. Yes. Are there any more questions? Uh, we have a few more minutes. We have at least a five more min minutes at ten minutes. Uh, but I want to acknowledge another uh, statement that you made. Uh, when you said that the Indian problem, uh, we have, uh, you said uh, the Navajo problem, uh, we have uh, the Indian problem yeah. too, that's the way Canada uh, refers to the, um, the First Nation, the Métis, the Indian problem. And uh, that's another similarity that we share and uh, the boarding schools too. You had the boarding schools too. Uh, we have a resident. Uh, we had residential schools as well, and we have the Indian day schools, mm -hmm. and we still have schools who uh, send out uh, students uh, who want to attend high schools that they have to leave their communities. And uh, these are some of the similarities that we share, and uh, some of the reasons that. Um, First Nations, Indigenous peoples in Canada uh, left to go to residential schools was again uh, to clear the problem mm -hmm. of removing the Indians from the land. That is just, just the same reasoning. And um, okay, well, there's another comment that you made that, that really struck me. Uh, one of the that uh, the earth is alive with death. And that's a really interesting comment because uh, as indigenous peoples, uh, we look after the world and the land, the waters, right? We're supposed to be mm -hmm. stewards of the land and um, uh, biodiversity is alive with, uh, uh, with the species, our relatives of the little critters. Um, but as 
uh, human people, they're dying off because of this disease. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is a disease. Yeah. Okay, there's a few questions here. Uh, you mentioned uh, high rate of vaccination uh, with the Navajo nations. Uh, do you define hesitance among residents that they get vaccinated from? Um, you know, here in the Southwest, there's um, uh, Pueblo Nations, uh, Apaches, um, and Ute, and um, Dene Zuni, and remarkably and amazingly, um, our leaders were very attuned to the, to the messages, to the advice coming out of the Center for Disease Control. Um, they were, they locked, a lot of them locked down immediately, like there was road blockades and, and they, you know, you couldn't go into these communities. Um, and um, some of the, you know, we would talk to different people and, and, you know, they would say, yeah, that, you know, you can't go in or go, can't come in. Um, they they would bring they would the leaders the tribal leaders would say you know we're going to give you we we're we're providing everything you need there's no need for you to 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 leave our communities you know and so um, people were just like I, I think uh, my my what I understand is that our president Jonathan Nez had agreed to allow um, the vaccine to be tested on on Navajo people and that agreement include that included that we would have access to the vaccine. And so there was these wholesale um, spots where people were um, set, it was set up so that we could get vaccinated. And so we do have, and I don't know what the number is right now, but we have quite a few, a huge number of our people who are vaccinated now, you know, and I drove, I had to, I drove to um, Gallup and, you know, Border, it, it, border towns, uh, urban spaces, our indigenous people don't have good access to health care. Okay? So health care you can get on the Navajo Nation, um, which is for all Navajo citizens. And so I had to drive from Albuquerque to Gallup, um, where there's a, one of the largest Indian health services. Um, and I got my vaccine. That's 120 miles one way to get my vaccine. And then two weeks later, I went back for my second vaccine. So now everybody, you know, when you meet people, they, every, the first thing you say to each other is, I'm vaccinated. You know, so now the the, pro, the advice from CDC is that people who've been vaccinated um, can meet in small groups. Yeah. Okay, and there's another question here. Um, we have the Indian Act in Canada contributing to a vulnerability to health and social issues uh, for Indigenous peoples. Um, uh, do you have a similar act in uh, the USA affecting the Navajo Nation? We don't have um, um, Indian Act. We do have federal Indian policies and, and U.S. laws that directly contribute to the, the disparities, including the health disparities. You know, if... Um, I sometimes I'll talk to one of the th best things to do um, as an indigenous person is when you go out to gatherings, conferences, events, um, you sit at a table of indigenous people or Dene, and they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. <laughs> okay? uh, and so um, one of the things about the health service in the United States, the health care for indigenous people that's funded um, by the federal government is that it's it's always um, very um, little funding. It's not enough to provide adequate health care. Um, and so if there's not enough health care provided, then you have these conditions, including, you know, diabetes, um, heart disease, um, and those things. And so the, so you have a sustained failure um, to provide adequate health care. Okay? Um, and so th those are th the same conditions here. So if Indian Health Service was also already inadequate in terms of its resources, you can imagine what it's what it's what the havoc that's being um, um, wreaked now, because one of the things with priority of of COVID patients, then other people are not getting um, their health care as well. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Denital, and uh, we want to thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, it's been insightful, and uh, there's a few comments here regarding the boarding schools and uh, the way we need to take control. Uh, but at this time, uh, we're going to go into the a little exercise, a stretching exercise uh, that's going to be led by Evan Machimakazi. And then uh, we're going to have uh, the 12.30 session, uh, the 11.30 session, sorry. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Jennifer, and we'll talk to you again. Thank you. Okay. okay. So we're at 11.22, and we're going to be going into the um, sessions at 11.30. And so as uh, Merle has indicated, this is a stretching exercise. So please take this time to uh, grab yourself a drink, um, get refreshed uh, before you head into the 11.30 uh, sessions. So please um, take a moment and uh, take a moment for yourself and uh, we'll see you back at the sessions at 11.30. Yeah!